Good morning, church. My name is Justin. I'm the student pastor here at our Poto campus. And this morning's scripture is Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Justin just bragged to me that he's the only scripture reader to memorize this whole scripture. So I'm notching his belt right there. This weekend, I got to go spend some time with a couple of guys that I, I knew well in college, a couple of my friends, and uh, we, you know, we spent time on the lake and catching up on a lot of things, and uh, I had to come back and preach today, and so they asked me, what are you preaching on on Sunday? And I said, well, uh, the sixth commandment in Exodus, um, you shall not murder. They're like, what are you going to talk about for 32 minutes about, you know, it's pretty clear, kind of cut and dried, you shouldn't murder. And that's a, a fair question, but unfortunately it's, uh, it's not that hard to answer in the day and age in which we live. Uh, the clear commandments of Scripture are, are certainly not um, taken um, at face value any longer. Uh, this past week or so, uh, maybe a week or a little bit longer, I, I came across an article, and it was a headline that was rather shocking. Um, it's written in the in Bloomberg Journal, um, written by a lady named Esme E. Deprez. And the article title, the reason it stuck out to me it was this, is How I, How I Helped My Dad Die, um, the article, the title of the article. And so this is Esme kind of walking through her life. She begins the article with a phone call um, from her dad in which he said, Hey, um, I think I'm ready. And then she rewinds and takes us back through the days and weeks and months that led up to this decision. And so her dad had been uh, a runner, uh, one of those strong, fit guys for much of his life, was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, and he, his body began to feel the effects of that disease, um, weakened in many ways. And um, deciding that he wanted to die on his own terms and die with dignity is what, how he described it. He decided he wasn't going to let his body get to where he couldn't function in any way, and uh, he was going to take his own life. And so his daughter is writing this article about all the ways she thought that she could take her father's life. You know, um, should I shoot him? I mean, literally having this discussion in the midst of this article. Um, and as he did get worse and worse, they decided they were going to do it. Maine apparently has a law uh, where you can um, assist in suicide. And so uh, they went to several doctors, ended up getting some sort of concoction. And then on this day, they wheeled him out his front door onto the porch um, where he could be in the sunlight and feel it on his skin. And he whispers to his daughter, um, I think it's time. And she gives him this concoction that takes his life and talks about being overcome with grief at the loss of her father. Do not murder isn't as clear at times as it should be. Uh, in a society um, where truth tends to be under attack and um, clear ethics uh, seem to be few and far between, what does it really mean, do not murder? What did God mean when he said that? Now, I want to answer that question for you today, but I want to begin back in Genesis and just give you um, the Christian view of life first and foremost. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, you kind of know what's happened thus far if you've been around the church. God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke everything into existence, and he made the plants and the animals and the stars and the waters and the land mass and everything that we know and see. God spoke that into existence, uh, but with man he did something interesting. Everything else he'd merely put out there, but with regard to man, it says this in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 27, it says, that, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. All of the other creatures God had made, but man, the pinnacle of God's creation, God created in his own image. He gave man dominion over the earth. We are created to reflect God's likeness, his image to those who are around us. And we were created to have a relationship with our creator. We were made in the image of God. And because we were made in God's image, created by God and for God, we know that every single life has value. And not value based upon the externals, right? What can you produce? You know, how good of a citizen are you? But rather, because every man and woman was made in the image of God, every single life has intrinsic value and worth, which means our value, again, isn't on the externals. It's not how good of a life did you live? You know, how much money were you able to make? Were you a good mom or a good dad or a good kid? 
it or whatever it might be, we have intrinsic worth having been made in the image of God. Every single life is precious. This is Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. The psalmist just reflecting on God creating him. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very, very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, and when as yet there was none of them. Now, we live in a culture that likes to divide people into all sorts of classes and categories and ascribe more worth to one than the other. Um, maybe it's uh, you're poor or you're rich or you're educated or non-educated. You're white versus black or any of the other colors that might come with that. You're a male or you're female and tries to ascribe worth to people uh, based upon these various classifications. I don't know if you've heard of intersectionality, but it teaches you to view the whole world through lens of perceived power that comes from your privilege. But just... I want to say that's all nonsense because for the heart of a Christian, we look at every single person and see that they are precious in the sight of God. They are valuable to us no matter what the color of their skin or their political viewpoints or their perceived power in our society. Everyone is loved and is precious to God. So we value everyone the same. Interestingly enough, um, we don't elevate men over women. Uh, God created them in his image, male and female. So both of us are image bearers of God. It's pretty simple. Sometimes we like to overcomplicate things a bit. I learned a song um, back in one of those rooms when I was a little kid. It goes something like this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, brown and white. They are precious in his sight. And this is true. As believers in Jesus Christ, every single life is precious to us because it was precious to God. We are made in his image. So what does this mean? Uh, do not murder. Now, uh, clearly, uh, I would hope that none of us in this room have committed murder. That would be ideal, and yet uh, we live in a difficult world, right? So the word murder here, it, it's actually just two words in the Hebrew. Um, it is lo ratzak is the, the Hebrew word, and it really means no murder, right? That's, that's what this is teaching us. And so um, if, if you don't get anything else today, don't murder, right? Just kind of put that out of your mind. If you've been thinking about it, you know, just don't do that, and, and life will be better for all of us, right? So there it is in its simplicity. But what does that entail? What constitutes this murder and what doesn't? Um, I want to walk you through a few things that do not constitute murder on the front end. Uh, the first is this. Um, hunting and killing animals... I know some of you love animals. You think they're a member of your family. Uh, but um, killing animals does not constitute murder. Genesis chapter uh, 9, verses 3 and 4 says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. So every hunter in here just know that you are fulfilling your God-given destiny when you go hunt something down and kill it and serve it to your family, right? That's what God has intended for us to do if you don't hunt perfectly okay. Um, but hunting is not murder despite what those persuasive ads might tell you on YouTube, right? Um, the second, accidents are not murder. Um, and sometimes things happen in our lives that are absolutely tragic um, and beyond our control. Uh, I was uh, 19 years old, driving down I-40. I've been staying up all night studying for finals at Oklahoma State University. Two of my best friends were getting married to each other uh, the next day, and so I've got to make it home. And somewhere along the way, I, I began to feel a little bit drowsy and thought, I need to stop and get something to drink or I'm not going to make this trip. And uh, nine miles outside of South Salt, Oklahoma, my truck left the, the road, and I woke up bouncing furiously and uh, went off of a creek and slammed in the other side of another. And I can only say, 
thank God that I didn't go the other way, right? That the truck didn't go into oncoming traffic. Um, if something like that would have happened, uh, the Bible would not call it murder. It's merely an accident. Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 5 says, As when someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood, and his hand swings the axe to cut down a tree, and the head slips from the handle uh, and strikes his neighbor so that he dies, he may flee to one of these cities and live. So the punishment for murder was death, right? Life for life. And yet here in this case where the axe slipped from the handle, somebody dies. It isn't considered murder. It's not punishable by death. Okay, so um, hunting animals, uh, accidents. And the third one here is self-defense. It is not murder when you protect yourself or your family from harm. Exodus chapter 22, verses 2 says, If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. So if you're protecting your family from someone who wishes to um, harm you in some way, you are not committing murder in that. Now, it does say here, uh, but if the sun has risen, and you can see that that thief was leaving your home and you do kill him, then you are indeed guilty. So be careful with the self-defense thing. You can go too far, right? If you're just frustrated um, that something got stolen, you don't get to kill somebody for it. Animals, accidents, self-defense. Uh, the fourth one here is capital punishment. Now, wherever you may feel about that politically, the scriptures are clear. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his image. And so this is actually prescribed by God. The punishment for sin, is, or for, it is the punishment for sin is death, but the punishment for murder in this particular case is uh, death yourself. So um, the final one here is, a, is in the case of a just war. Um, God at the time sent the Israelite people to war. There was killing that happened there in the midst of this just pursuit that God had uh, prescribed, and yet it wasn't considered murder. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not significant, right? We send men and women to war. The things that they see and the things that they endure as a result oftentimes stick with them for the rest of their lives. And so uh, I'm kind of rolling through these, kind of giving you the scriptural examples, but I don't want you to take um, any sort of killing lightly, right? It's not insignificant. So none of those things are considered murder according to the scriptures, but what does? What does constitute murder? What did God have in mind when he said, don't murder? The first, just to be kind of most clear, the lorat sak, the word, it really gives us the idea of intentional uh, or premeditated killing. So if you're thinking about that, don't do it, right? This should be right off the top of your head. Um, if your planet, you know, your neighbor's been letting his dog come over and do his business in your yard and you're really frustrated or something's come up, anything that would be intentional taking of life, um, that would be considered murder. This was the case when Cain killed his brother Abel because Abel had offered a better sacrifice. He killed his brother. This is what happens when sin enters into the world, right? There's this brokenness this tendency toward anger or rage that would ultimately lead us to murder. This is what happened in the Pulse nightclub shooting. You might have heard about it. It was in Orlando when a shooter who said he was bitter at the U.S. government for killing a terrorist goes into this nightclub and kills 49 people and wounds 53 others. This is generally the case with murder. Um, somebody has intentionally committed this. They did it in a premeditated fashion or uh, in a moment they got angry and they killed somebody. So that's the first um, intentional or deliberate killing of somebody. The second case is uh, that of negligence. And this is something we need to be diligent about. Um, Exodus chapter 21 verses 28 and 29 uh, it says, when an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. So something bad happens here, right? Uh, an ox gets out and they don't know about its temperament, ends up goring someone and they die. Um, you just kill the ox. You don't hold the owner liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past and its owner has been warned but has not kept it in and it kills a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death. Because life is inherently precious, we should treat it as such. So you need to go home, check with your ox, make sure everything is good there. There's another admonition about um, if you don't build some sort of uh, railing around the roof of your house and the 
You know, these sorts of times, it was common to actually rest in the evenings on the roof of your house. And it basically says, if you don't build a railing and someone falls off, it's kind of on you. So we should work as people, uh, whatever it might look like, if you don't hang out on your roof, probably best. But uh, whatever it might look like in your life, you work hard to protect life. You don't want to be negligent there. Now, the third case here um, that does constitute murder is the issue of abortion. And I want I know that this is... Um, a really charged issue in our culture today. Uh, where you align on your political party often uh, would suggest where you fall with regard to the issue of abortion. Um, but I want you to know the Bible is not unclear. The Bible is emphatically clear here. Okay, I want to read to you in Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. It says, when, a, when men strive together, this would be fighting, by the way, um, and they hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him. He shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. Did you see what the Bible just called that thing that was inside the pregnant woman's belly? It was a life. And God values every life as precious. It wasn't a cluster of cells. It wasn't, you know, something insignificant that didn't matter. That was a life. So as the people of God who follow Jesus and not our political party, um, we need to be emphatic about this. Abortion is always sin. It is offensive to God. And we should never in any way um, give approval we should certainly not have commit abortion, right? We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't give our approval to it. Um, and I would just argue for you that if anything should make you question somebody that you're intending to vote for, it should be that they don't value life itself in the same way that God does. Now, I'll let you make your voting decisions. I won't tell you who that is, but I want to be really clear what the Bible says about abortion, and that is, it is, it's, that is murder, okay? Uh, the final piece here is in the case of suicide or euthanasia. We, we kind of covered this in my opening illustration. Um, this is becoming more and more common. Euthanasia in Canada is fairly prominent, and our north, northern states tends to be uh, more prevalent than in the south, and yet this is coming where maybe someone is sick, or they are infirm in some way. Maybe they're seen as unfit or, or whatever it might be. And so what you do is you just end that life early and kind of get the whole process over with. They weren't worth anything anyway is kind of the thinking. Um, listen, it's murder. Every life, every person is made in the image of God and is precious to him and should be precious to us. That is true of every human life, of every unborn human life, of every child born with special needs, uh, of every elder and aging and infirm person. Every single life is precious before God and should be precious to us. So those are the things that are considered murder biblically. Um, and if you think, okay, I've done all right. Maybe you look at murder as this really big sin and you're really thankful that you haven't committed it. Well, we're not quite done. Because Jesus Christ, God who became flesh, uh, when he walked on this earth, he actually talked about this specific commandment. Um, and he gave us a fuller and clearer understanding of God's intention in giving us this commandment in Exodus chapter um, 20 verse 13. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard that it was said of old, right? Because we're quite a ways removed from the time that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. Um, you have said that it was, you know, or you've heard that it was said of old, uh, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. You guys know, you've heard the Ten Commandments. Uh, you shall not murder, and the punishment for murder uh, was death. And so you know that Someone murders, they're going to stand before the court, and they're, I mean, they're guilty. They should receive their just punishment, right? And everyone in the crowd that was listening to Jesus would have said, absolutely, the punishment for murder is death. You kill somebody, you deserve to die. But then he goes on. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. He keeps going. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fire of hell. And this isn't just a human judgment. This is certainly divine judgment. 
So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, you leave your gift there before the altar and go and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gifts. And what Jesus did in referencing this commandment and then giving a fuller, more clear meaning of what God meant when he said, told us not to murder, um, he basically said that merely restraining our rage or our anger or our bitterness or unforgiveness Restraining our desire to go and to kill someone, that's, that is not the path that God has for us. That is not righteous living. Merely restraining um, um, outwardly what you feel inwardly is not the path to life. As a matter of fact, you're still living in sin and you're controlled by it. Avoiding violent acts isn't enough. He wants us to be inwardly righteous as much as we are outwardly righteous. Many of us would say, I'd never murder somebody. But you might have been angry and you thought about it. I would never kill a person. But you got angry and you said the thing. You regarded them as a fool, a raka, you good for nothing. Maybe you regard your political opponents that way. Don't care if they live or they die. Or maybe it's that person that you grew up with that hurt you. The person who said that they were your friend and then they turned against you. It's not enough to merely avoid these things outwardly. We should never have them in our heart in the first place. It's not enough to avoid murder. We need to have pure hearts. Murder happens in our hearts before it happens with our hands, right? Right? So what Jesus is seeking are are people with pure hearts, and he wants us to be really clear that even to be angry, to call someone a fool or a good-for-nothing, it's sin. You've broken the commandment. And so here's kind of how it goes. Um, Have you ever committed murder? In one of the ways I described earlier, if so, you are guilty, and you deserve the punishment for that sin. Have you ever called someone a fool? treated someone with scorn or obstinance, refused to serve them or care for them, care about them, Jesus would say, you're guilty and you deserve the same punishment. Have you ever regarded someone as good for nothing? Maybe written off a class of people because they disagree with you in some way, or you found them to be unimportant or invaluable. Jesus would say, you're guilty before the court. You deserve the punishment that you have coming to you. And this is where, as the people of God, we recognize that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this is why we don't walk around arrogantly pointing our fingers at other people. This is why we don't look down on people who have have committed sins that maybe we haven't committed with our hands, but they've been existing in our hearts. It's because we're guilty too. So whether you're here in this room and you've outwardly committed murder with your hands or you've just done it in your heart in some way, um, the problem here is that there's a relationship that's broken Our our perfectly holy and righteous and good God cannot have fellowship with someone who is a sinner, right? We're separated from God because of our sin. And the only hope that we have is to in some way be reconciled. Jesus actually points us to that at the end of this verse. Therefore, if you're there to worship, you got a gift that you're bringing, you're going to you know, worship God in some way, um, and you remember that you got an issue with your brother, there's bitterness or unforgiveness or something going on between you, you need to leave your gift there and first go and be reconciled to your brother. And that's exactly what God did for us, isn't it? You, you, you remember God who we were separated from him because of our sin. God didn't do anything wrong. He was perfect. And yet God looked out at us, and he didn't give us what we deserve. I mean, really, if anything, God should have just left us to our own ends, right? And he didn't pour out his wrath on us for our sin. But God saw the separation between us and him, and he chose to intervene and act on our behalf. 
For those of us who have sinned against God and rebelled against him, we've gone our own way. We've treated the King of kings and the Lord of lords as if he wasn't important or as if he didn't know what he was talking about. We have spent our entire lives sinning against God and going our own way. And what did God give us for that? God saw that sin that was separating us from him. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect, sinless life. Jesus went to the cross and he endured the suffering and the agony, the nails driven through his wrists and his feet. And he did that for us. For those of us who wouldn't trust in our own goodness because, my goodness, we're sinners. We're all guilty today. We've all been angry. We've all called someone a fool. We've all committed murder. And rather than trusting in our own righteousness because it isn't good enough, we would instead trust in Jesus Christ and his work for us. Jesus there on the cross, he bore our sin, he bore our shame, he bore our guilt. If you committed murder in this room and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're not a murderer. You're not your sin, you're not what you once did. Jesus took all of that, sin, guilt, and shame, and there on the cross, he bore the just punishment for sin such that it's finished. The punishment has been rendered Jesus has finished his work. And we stand back no longer in our sin in which we once lived, but now we're beneficiaries of that righteous life of Christ. He took our sin, our guilt, our shame, and placed it on Jesus and credited the righteous, perfect life of Jesus to us so that we could be reconciled to God. I want you to know that if you're here today and you've committed murder and you've trusted in Jesus, and God has forgiven you. He's taken your sin and your guilt and your shame. And you need not bear it anymore. Don't walk another second in guilt or condemnation. Jesus has already paid the price for that. He's taken your sin away. But that really isn't the end of it, is it? We see that the way that God reconciled us, that means restore the relationship, by the way. The way that God reconciled us to himself was he went, right? He sent Jesus who offered himself on our behalf. And then Jesus looks at us here in Matthew chapter 25 and says, you have relational brokenness with your brother? Bitterness or anger or unforgiveness? Does your brother have something against you? It's not how Christians are supposed to live. Leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother. And you might think, Listen, the person that sinned against me, they don't deserve me reconciling. They don't deserve my forgiveness. Man, they deserve the, the bitterness and the wrath and the anger. They deserve death for what they did to me. But then we remo- were reminded of how we were before God, right? That what we deserved for our sin was death and eternity and hell. But what God gave to us was grace and mercy and his forgiveness. And he drew us into a relationship with him. And so the way that we extend mercy and we seek to be reconciled to our brothers, not on the basis of their actions, rather it's on the basis of God's action. We too were sinners undeserving, and God reconciled us us to himself. And so we should, in the same way, seek to be reconciled to our brother and our sister who have sinned against us or whom we have sinned against. We don't walk around with hearts full of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. We seek to have pure hearts. To not just avoid murder outwardly, but we also want to avoid it inwardly. So, there's two things I want to encourage you to do today. Um, One, the first, if you're a believer here and you have broken relationships, you should, biblically, seek to be reconciled to God. Matter of fact, the implication of what Jesus was saying there is, um, don't come and try to worship God while you have broken relationships with your brother. Now, there is a, a couple things I want to talk about there. The first is you should, um, as much as it depends upon you, seek to be at peace with all men. Um, we can't always fix um, broken relationships because we're only half of that equation, right? So you should seek to be reconciled as much as it depends upon you. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is there are situations in this life um, that are not cut and dry. Maybe you have an abuser. Um, 
The last thing you ever want to do is reach out, right? I would just say, consult with your community group. Seek wisdom from godly people on what that might look like for you. There are scenarios where you probably need to keep your distance as much as possible, okay? So um, move forward in wisdom with reconciliation, all right? The second thing that we do is if you're here, uh, you haven't been reconciled to God. You would acknowledge you've been angry, and bitter. You've harbored unforgiveness. You've had murderous thoughts in your heart, or maybe you've even murdered outwardly. But rather than trusting in Jesus Christ and his work, you've been trying to handle it on your own, and you know the crushing weight of sin that you can't hardly bear. What you've done, the guilt and the shame, the burden of unforgiveness. Today, um, I want to invite you to no longer trust in yourself, but instead trust in the work of Jesus Christ, what he did before you, that you might be reconciled to God, that he might set you free from the bitter and anger and unforgiveness, that you might enjoy the abundant life that Jesus Christ has for you. So if you've never trusted in Christ, and today God is drawing your heart to him, you're hearing and understanding the gospel, um, I'm going to pray, and right after, I'm going to be right down here. I'd love to to discuss what it means for you to follow after Jesus Christ. Um, If you don't want to talk to me. There are people sitting in every single row that would love to talk with you about the gospel and what it means to follow him. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, we should never be anything but thankful because we're a people that sinned against you in greater ways than we've ever been sinned against. We've mocked you in our hearts. We've rebelled against you. We've gone our our own ways. God, we've done it for our entire lives. And yet somehow, you are so good that you could look through our offenses, through our sin, through our taking you for granted. And God, what you saw were people that were precious and people that you loved. And God, rather than giving us what we deserve for that sin, you sent your son Jesus to suffer in extraordinary ways, to bear the the cost of our sin. So God, we, we can only be thankful. We praise you for your goodness. God, thanks for taking a person like me who had every chance to get it right, a great family, a great church, all the things I should have, and yet, God, I still sin against you. And God, rather than giving me what I deserve, you saved me. God, you've restored me. You've given me a relationship with you. And you filled my life with blessing and joy, and none of those things are deserved. So I pray for the person who's here that doesn't know you, that today you would draw their heart to faith in you, that they might respond to you in in faith and, and no longer trusting in themselves, but trusting in the work of Jesus on their behalf. God, may you save. And God, for people who are here whose hearts are filled with bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, been carrying grudges and pain for years, Lord, I I pray that today would be the day that you set them free. Today they might leave this place and make a phone call and begin to pursue reconciliation. That in wisdom they would walk alongside godly people to know what that looks like. But Lord, that they would see in obedience to your word that it's not enough to just not murder outwardly, but we shouldn't carry those things at our hearts either. They begin to follow after you. And so Lord, we pray that you would have your way in our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?